So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and members of Engineers Ireland. My name is John Byrne, Director of Sectoral Engagement with Engineers Ireland, and you're all very welcome to this, the fourth of our 16 lectures in our 2021 Engineers Ireland Sustainability Grand Tour. This is a lecture series, which is a collaboration between our West, Southeast, Cork, Northern, Midlands, GB, and Northeast regions, the Energy, Environment, and Climate Action Division, and our Roads and Transportation and Academic Societies. These lectures will run between January and April, so please keep an eye on your social media feed for constant updates. Today, we are the guests of the Cork Regional Branch. Cork Region is a hub for members based in Cork City and County, representing all sectors of the industry, providing local CPD and networking events for engineers, and I'm very happy now to introduce you all to the chair of the Cork Region Committee, Mr. Ronan Keane, Chartered Engineer. Ronan, can I now ask you to open this afternoon's event? Thank you very much, John. Um, Cork Region is absolutely delighted to be taking part in the uh, Sustainability Grand Tour series with our colleagues from the various regions and sectors of Engineers Ireland. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Vincent Lane, who's going to discuss uh, energy efficient design. Uh, so Vincent, uh, as you'll hear from his accent, uh, hails from South Africa. Uh, he studied mechanical engineering and then went on to do a master's in um, energy engineering. And uh, both of those were at uh, the University of Cape Town. Um, so he started out his career in the beverage industry, then went on to focus on industrial energy sector, uh, working in a wide range of industries. Um, so uh, from there, he, in 2015, um, joined FDT um, and become, began, began working in energy efficient design and energy management in a wide range of industries, including the, the brewing industry. Uh, Vincent is a member of the Mechanical Engineers Institute of South Africa, Engineers Ireland, and the Institute of Re Refrigeration in Ireland and the UK. Uh, he's a reg registered energy auditor with the SEA SEAI and uh, NISAS lead assessor. Um, and more recently, and very uh, pertinent, he's been working on the committee involved in uh, revising the IS399 standard, uh, which is the topic of today's uh, lecture. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Vincent. Thanks very much, Ronan. I'll just share my screen over there. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, today, we're going to just go through IS399. Uh, this is the 2014 version. So but we will have a look at the proposals for for the next revision. And today, we're going to structure our talk in kind of three in three parts key concepts of is399 we're going to look at kind of what we think has worked and what spurred the, the the latest revision and we will use case studies as we go along so it's not just going to be front-loaded kind of um what's the call it uh front-loaded just with theory um we will have a look at some detailed case studies at the end. So just to, yeah, without further ado, the key concepts. So why, why we call these key concepts is if you were going for an exceed grant or you were being audited on a project that, that had submitted, you know, to the methodology of IS399, the, these are the four fundamental principles that I think would have to be in your in, in your paperwork trail, not just from a standard point of view, but just when we go through them, you'll see the logic um, of the methodology and and why IS three nine nine is as it is. Um, and yeah, I would I would definitely call the challenge and analyze the heart of it, and we'll get there. So for me, so I'm not going to take you through the whole process of how to do you know, an, an IS399 um, project from start to finish. I'm just going to focus on these. And to start with, I think the energy balance is one of the most important parts. So say now you were developing a new asset, whether it be a greenfield site or, you know, retrofitting an existing, a, a, a new product line or process into an existing facility, you would need to come up with some kind of energy balance for that new asset. And 
that asset could be a building, it could be a hotel, it could be, you know, it could be a leisure center, whatever it is, it could be a healthcare facility. The first thing you would need to establish, and the standard isn't, doesn't dictate how you establish the energy baseline, but you would need to establish one. So you could do that by a calculation. You could use research and a benchmark you know, from published figures. You could use modeling in the case of buildings to model what, you know, given the fabric, how much energy it, it, it should use. Um, your baseline should include all energy uses and sources, and it should have a reference to cost and it should be annualized. And I'd say the primary benefit of this is if, if done correctly, it will highlight what the significant energy uses are for that asset. And then you can start to challenge those and analyze, you know, do we need all that energy consumption? Um, another thing the energy balance will do, it will show whoever the asset operator will be, the owner and the operator might be different parties. It'll show them how much they need to budget for that energy. And, you know, is that an acceptable amount or not? Um, so once, when we do our studies, we like to come up with a baseline. So kind of the lilac column. And in this case, for a packaging line, we had an existing process and there was a difference. So this caused us to, to look back and say, why is there this difference? And there was a slight difference in the technology and we came up with a reason and, and we could present this to a client. And we'll come back to, the, to this example. So another thing you would typically do is you would, you would produce some kind of pie chart for your electrical usage. Often an OEM will provide you with, with demand data and you would have to apply some form of capacity factor and is the asset going to operate at full load? So from, from the demand data, you would build an energy consumption profile. And you know, depending on the data you have available, you could have many different slices in your pie, so to speak. But one thing in most in most projects, and I'm sorry, I am from an industrial background, if you will, from industry, like you'd, you'd get given, okay, we need this much nitrogen, this much glycol, this much compressed air. Often we don't bring those back in back to electricity. So in this study, what was surprising was once we took the, the, the process demand back into electricity, it doubled the electrical consumption. And, not that it caught us by surprise, but it, it was just surprising that it was so much. Um, again, you can do the same thing for thermal demands. And for me, the, the fundamental thing is if you do this process correctly, you will come up with a bunch of significant energy uses and you'll be able to highlight which are the, the greatest ones. And in this example, the pasteurizer is nowhere near as much as the, 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 the energy used for hot water to, to clean the inside of packaging containers. So this allows you then to really go and challenge that energy service. So another thing it doing this level of detail allows is, is what is the basis uh, for, 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 for this consumption? For instance, is this, is this summer water temperature? Is that what the suppliers use? Are they using 15 degrees? And will this balance be reflective of what happens in winter if the water was at five degrees? So, and the fundamental part, I think, of IS399 is once you start to challenge the energy services, you can really start to, if you can reduce them in quality and quantity, you can make savings. And, there's knock-on effects with respect to the, that utility pipe, the, the, the structure that holds up the goalposts, that hold up the pipe bridge, the automation costs, the electrical cable size. So it's really important. And, and we'll move on to the challenge and analyze and show you how this is done in IS399, but it's really important to challenge the energy service. So, and like I said earlier on, this is the heart of the, the the, the, the process for me. So some people describe the HAZOP, uh, the, the challenge and analyze like a HAZOP for energy. Okay, and 
it, it uses the principle of the energy Venn diagram, which we'll come to, and it's the ED expert expert's role to to implement this process. But for a successful for a successful challenge and analyze, you need the asset owner or a representative to be there. You need members of the design team, outside specialists in some cases, and the OEM suppliers. And especially if this process starts off early in a project, and we'll come to that issue in a bit, it can really be beneficial. And you'll come up with a set of opportunities, and you might come up with 50 opportunities, but you might do, you might do an initial assessment on them, and maybe only 10 or 12 are really viable. And those are the ones that you would do a detailed assessment on, you know, are there co-benefits? Perhaps some of your opportunities improve the product throughput um, or, or the comfort, you know, of, of the building. And are they practicable to implement? Is there risk? Are there corporate or legal requirements you need to look at? Or other criteria established by, by, by the organization that's, that's paying for, for this project? So, these are all factors that need to, to be considered when selecting opportunities. So going back to the energy Venn diagram, and I suppose if you've been on um, any call involving any, any lecture or talk involving IS399, you would have seen this diagram before. And when I say energy service, it's important here that we establish what that is. So, if I'm delivering a product, a food and beverage product, I want it to be free from micro. So the, the energy service there is, is, is a product free from micro contamination. It's, the energy service is not the steam sterilization. That is the process. I use 150 degree steam to sterilize that product. I could have used potentially a chemical sterilization process. So think of Milton's baby formula for your bottles versus a steam sterilizer. Um, again, as you move out of this onion, out the layers of the onion diagram, you get to affect the amount of energy used less and less. Not to say that each of the layers isn't important. That, that's not what I'm saying. So in this, as engineers, we always like to jump straight in to change the, the boiler or change the steam generator. But that's not the right place to start. I mean, your, your, your project might start there, but if you do your, your challenge and analyze, you might realize, hold on, we could, we, could, we could change the energy service and therefore save money on the equipment we're buying. And we'll come to that in, in an example a little bit later. So again, control the control of the, the equipment, operations and maintenance, very very critical does 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 the client's organization have the labor force with the correct technical skills to operate this or you're going to come back to that asset in three or four years time and and the pressure relief valves are held down by you know like a cable cable tie so you know even with the best intentions and really good technology if the operations team doesn't have the capability or the training you know that's a problem um and then the last layer is obviously housekeeping management do you install an asset and just leave it there and never look at it again you know that's often a problem so benchmarking trending the data it's an important part of the process so going back to our example that we saw earlier on another slide in, in this case the design team themselves had come up with a whole bunch of interventions to re that would reduce the consumption of the new asset. And as the ED expert, I'm not there to be the subject matter expert. I'm there to facilitate the process to. So it doesn't matter that I didn't come up with these. That's not the point of the exercise. The point is to, to come up to, to realistically forecast what the asset's going to use and try and minimize its life cycle cost. During the challenge and analyze, with members of the design team, outside specialists, we came up with a few extra ideas that could be implemented by the client, which, which would then take the asset to you, would allow the asset to use far less than the, the, the current existing process. And that's 
that's where we want to get to essentially we want to have assets that use as little energy as possible okay so then moving on to the next sphere we we call this design for energy man management and there's kind of three there's three components to this there's energy the measurement planning so can we can we measure and report you know what this asset is consuming and producing and i suppose that's an important one because we might have corporate standards we might have an energy management system on the site we there might be requirements due to part l building regulations epa requirements best available technology so there, there's a lot of factors that determine your energy measurement plan also can i verify so we embark on this energy efficient design process we come up with, with a set of reasonable opportunities they get implemented can we measure the difference between what where we started and where we went to and and we'll look at that in performance verification in more detail two other components of the design for energy management are the energy variables review so what will affect the asset in normal operation that could change its efficiency you know part load weather or climate change changes in the area um, are there product requirement changes that are coming down the line if for instance if it was a building occupancy these types of things so we need to scenario plan to know how our asset will react in these in these situations and then lastly performance deterioration so we put in this heat exchanger it saves us energy after after a few years of operation is it performing at the same at the same standard as when we installed it two or three years ago and can we measure that so we need to leave assets for the operations team that that can we can measure the performance and we can diagnose and fix deteriorations in these so these these are kind of sanitized examples from a manufacturing plant and a packaging plant of actual outputs that we would give the client we would go through pnids we'd we'd look at where the metering is you know this is on supply but we we want metering on demand as well but in this case that the client had control valves so maybe it's better to 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 get a proxy measurement rather than paying for a new flow meter so these are the kind of levels of detail you can get into another example here was on an effluent stream from a cleaning process to take out the heat to use in the incoming batch so again is there condition monitoring that we can ensure this asset is operating? We, we, you know, we've paid 100,000 euros for this asset. Is it operating as well now, as well, sorry, in the future as it did the day it was commissioned? And, and those are important questions. So the last kind of sphere that's, I think, critical for any ED project is to be able to benchmark the performance. So. I just take a little bit of time to explain the graph on the, the, the picture on the right here. So depending where, when the ED process came and, and met the project, it could have been at the concept stage, we are doing ED on this, on this project. We want a new, a new clean room and we want to subject it, to, subject it to ED. So we used our existing assets as a benchmark and therefore we had an energy balance at a we then go away we come up with a set of suggestions we implement some of them the more practical ones and at at handover to the ops team do we do we simply do a verification you know at handover based on a, a day or weeks operation or do we wait a period a few months a year so we've got seasonality involved and, and take another snapshot of 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 the assets performance so it's it's important to think about these things because if you are going for a grant from seai for exceed for instance this will be a requirement um also if investors are putting in money and there's paybacks that have been that have been outlined in the challenge and analyzed these need to be proven at the end or else there's there's no integrity in the process so these are 
these are very this is a very important step and just an important one, obviously we want to measure the energy consumed by the asset, but we also want to know, can we verify its output? I mean, I suppose that applies to buildings and, and we talk about comfort levels, but can you measure the CO2 levels? Can you measure the temperature, the air changes, the lux levels? So you need to think about that in your, in, in your projects. An example here was a, a new filling line in Africa and the supplier put in energy energy and utilities consumption meters but they expected the client to take that back to their plc and we were like hold on that the guy that operates this machine is going to read this screen regularly to see detailed statistics about what the line's producing why not have the media consumption there and this was a change that, that the software engineers made on site so at least now it's really easy for the ops team to benchmark their performance. And this is the kind of level you should be going down to in your projects. And I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily need an EED study to kind of affect these changes, but yeah, it, like I say, it is like a has up for, for, for energy consumption. And these are the kinds of questions that, that will be answered in a good energy efficient design review. So I kind of, that's a brief outline on, on, on the core, I'd say the core concepts of IS399. So let's go now and just take a look at the future revisions, but also what's worked well and what hasn't. So initially IS399 was an energy management system, albeit I don't know anyone that's used it as such. Most people have ISO 50001. So what the new revision looks to achieve is to make this a project based solely a project based tool here's a project we've looked at the design we've made some changes we now believe it is as efficient as possible it will deliver the lowest life cycle energy consumption you can monitor and measure it really well you hand over to the ops team there may be a requirement if they've got an energy management system on site it's really easy then for them to integrate that into the energy management system if they have one, or if it's a new site, the asset we know has looked, has asked all these questions. It, it should be much easier for the site to set up an energy management system for this asset. Another important, I, I suppose, reason for the changes to, to, to make it part of the project was that we don't have two independent projects running separately. Here's their guys doing EED and they never talk to the project team. That's not we, what we want. So the new revision looks to ensure that the EED, EED documentation as well as its project execution plan are integrated within the project documents to stop you know, two, two projects running alongside each other. And obviously now the core focus will be on the asset and management, not management, but measuring its energy consumption and impact and its and, and forecasting its consumption, it, it, it's solely on the project. So we're hoping that would lead to a wider adoption of the standard. Um, moving on, there's been a few role changes. So again, earlier on in the presentation, I would have been say, referring to ED experts. So one of the proposed changes is to call that role ED facilitator, which, which can be less standoffish between the design team and the EED team. And, and really the, the energy efficient design team is there to facilitate, to facilitate the process of IS399. The design team often contains the experts. So I think that's a good change. Another change is the EED owner role. So there he there's a clause now specifically to call out that he's responsible to ensure that the the design team implements the approved outputs of the ed project and he, he reports to top management so those outputs would be approved by top management so he's there to ensure the project team delivers on those outputs and I, I think one of the best changes that's been made is mention of the project manage, manager in the standard, because of, of his, often the project manager 
is a senior member in the project team and he's, his core focus, his or her core focus is budget and time, budget and time. And EDs for those guys on the side, you know, and, and, and that's been a problem, I, I think, in a lot of projects. So we, we really hope now that the clause there says he is responsible for making sure that the ED process is integrated into the wider project management and implementing the actions as approved by top management. So to some extent, the EED owner isn't off the hook, but at least there's, there's some culpability on the project manager to ensure that management's approved actions are implemented. I think, I think that's critical um, going forward. Then moving on, Another, the, uh, again, if, if the challenge and analyze is the heart of the, the IS399 process, one of the core fundamental, uh, what, what would you say, the, the core thing is to get in early as possible. And often, often as the, you, you, get, you get introduced to a project once the, the large equipment's ordered so that, time, so that lead times are, for the project are safe. And at that stage, you're almost through the detailed design. There, there might be a bit of pipe de pipeline design, electrical reticulation design left to be done. But often there, the ship has sailed on, on, on how you can uh, affect changes on the asset. So, and, and again, once the concepts develop, people have got high level budget prices from suppliers, and then they develop a URS and they go out to tender. So, at this stage, it's already too late, even though the detailed design has not progressed. Too many projects adopt EED at this point, sometimes even procurement. And then we're into asking for variation orders on the project budget. And often, you know, we've heard, you know, that's a great idea, but we don't have the budget all the time. And this kills a lot of great ideas. And I think is, it, it, besides the, the project manager not having to be on the hook, this is this is a key piece that's been missing, I'd say. Not that the changes to the standard are gonna get people to do this, but we really, the risk and opportunities have been moved in the standard into the context. So when you set the context for the EED, we're asking people to look at the, the opportunity matrix you know, and to look at the risks and opportunities. Do, do I put that, that plant 50 meters down the road or do I put it closer to my neighbor who's got excess heat going up a stack? Those are fundamental opportunities that need to be looked at at the, at the beginning because you're either gonna pay more for your asset now or you're gonna pay over the next 20 years of its, of its life cycle. So, and again, so there's been some very good projects that have been implemented where EEDs come in late in the day. It's never too late. That's what I'd say. I'd just say, if you can get in at the pre-concept stage or concept stage where the interventions are part of the budget, you, you will have larger impact. So that's what this slide's about. Um, so, and then just the, some other, because it's a project-based standard, we, we, the, 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 the language around design for energy management will be retitled to energy efficiency and operation. And the, the same requirements of performance deterioration, the variables review, and the energy management planning are still, are still there. Sorry, the, the energy metering planning. Um, yeah, and, and obviously the outputs of the design, the design for in, the energy efficiency and operation would still feed into the site's energy management system. Um, again, performance verification is, a, is called out as a separate section. And at a very minimum, it must, you must verify the design energy performance of the significant energy consumers. So that's, that's coming down the line. So, so those are some of the changes that have been looked at. I think that will streamline the standard and make it really more applicable to, to use as a, for, 
for projects. Um, and really, I, I suppose the, the only thing I could say is try get in as early as possible. It makes a difference. Um, then just moving on, just a few case studies that, that, that we've chosen just because of different outcomes. So back when it was the SE, SEI, not the SEAI, um, FDT was appointed as, a, as the ED expert for a, a large dairy project, project where the dairy was looking to add 650 kilowatts of cooling capacity, which was roughly going to cost 100,000 euros. The guys went away and they, they, they looked at the processes in detail. So in, in a great length of detail, they used a, a pinch analysis you would have seen on the previous picture to, to outline the, the minimum energy consumptions and the temperatures at the pinch. And they would have done a detailed assessment on, on a casein plant and a cream cooling section of the plant. And they would have set the baseline energy consumptions they would have then rejigged the process and they came up with savings of 50% on chilled water and about 30% on steam of the casein plant's demand, which meant that the refrigeration plant upgrade did not have to go ahead at all. So, and the proposed payback was 6.5 months for the intervention. So, and again, this was a collaboration between the, the EED team, the dairy engineers, and the production teams on site. So there was, there was good groundwork done in the investigation and sensible measures put forward, which avoided the, the whole expansion project. So I suppose EED can have a large impact. That's what I'm saying, especially if it's done early. So here it was done before the project you know, what went ahead. Another example at Leo Pharma was an ED study on a CHP plant. And it, I suppose I've chosen this, this example for two reasons. One is any CHP project should have an energy efficient design done because knowing your thermal load is critical to the payback of the project. So at the start of the project, the site personnel thought that the load of the CHP engine would have been mainly low pressure hot water. But a, a part after the, the detailed facility energy balance, it was found that this was only 25% of the total thermal demand. So if you had sized for the whole thermal demand, the, the, the CHP engine would have been grossly oversized and you wouldn't have hit the paybacks and investors would not have been happy. So in addition to this, the site had embarked on other process improvements, which would have further decreased the thermal demand. Again, the reason for bringing that up is, is, is we're often guilty of working in silos. You know, John's working on that, Mary's working on that. We really, when we do an ED study on an asset, it has to be holistic and you should not view something in isolation because one project could change the payback on, on another. So again, that's, that's another really important reason why you need to look at the risks and opportunities of the project early. Um, moving on, another publicized case study was the Diageo New Guinness Brew House um, at St. James's Gate, which was a new 8 million hectoliter brewery with with a cold block and a, a utilities upgrade. So the ED here came in after the first set of PNIDs had been issued. So, I mean, essentially detailed design was done, the, the main supplier had been engaged. And even at this stage, the, the ED was able to have a massive impact. Because of the, the system they implemented there, they were able to reduce the, the peak steam load by 10 tons. And most importantly, the site output went up by 30%, but utility demand stayed flat, which is, which is incredible. 
the, the project also at the at the same time went for lead platinum and brium outstanding so ed wasn't competing but complementing i've worked in another project where the ed analysis helped get the the, the organization additional lead points so the 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 systems can be definitely complementary and again that was a large additional investment but it had a, a, a good payback um, so like like ronan mentioned earlier on we we were involved in revision of the standard in 2013 2014 and we're, we're we're involved in the current revision as members of the working committee with nsai um the the kind of last example i've chosen what is another brew house in Ghana and in this one again it was a it was a, a smaller brew house a 1 million hectoliter brew house and the, the 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 site team had engaged the supplier and they were about to order a brew house with with no special features from an energy point of view it would have helped them with throughput um, made a, a very much a batch process almost a semi-automated continuous process and they would have allowed them to use a larger amount of raw materials as inputs. The, the thing is that they were so focused on that, that they didn't take a step back and say, guys, this is, this is 2019. There's a massive opportunity here. So again, with a little bit more investment and a three year payback, they were able to redesign the brew house and the 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 real big thing here was that this brew house can now be run on on hot water which which is amazing and i'll get into that so if we just zoom in a little bit here normally this external calandria is what boils your wort and that can generally fit within one of these vessels when it's an internal calandria because steam is so has such a higher calorific value but this can now run on hot water it's huge but this has a massive impact because in the future the steam boilers can be replaced for hot water boilers pressurized hot water and it allows the site to to implement other technologies to feed into that hot water network so that's just a picture showing the scale of that external calandria it, it also meant that they needed a third cereal cooker so one two three shown at the back there in order to get their 12 brews a day so there, there was increased cost but the benefits are huge i mean africa is an area well endowed with sunshine so already there are companies such as solo tom offering deployable concentrated solar thermal which could easily feed into a hot water network so it's really it's really the case of you need to future proof your investments now given especially in the irish context we know that carbon tax is going to be 100 euros a ton by 2030 so you really again having a has up for your energy is, is important um, on top of that the site had installed a, had recently installed an 850 kilowatt pv system which would have offset the additional thermal energy pumping that would be required by the new efficient brew house so I suppose that's the reason I, I chose this is just future proof your assets take the time now to look at how will how will they look in 10 20 years. And just I suppose just before we get to Q a just some other projects we've been involved in um, a pilot plant expansion for a pharmaceutical plant we we've got there's been a lot of requests for net carbon master plans for companies again we've done that. At, for a medical device company, pharmaceutical plant, we've looked at ports, um, multiple packaging lines, and obviously an expansion plant at a silicon manufacturer. So I suppose a lot of these are industrial, but again, a port, there's lots of people out there doing healthcare facilities, new buildings. So ED is applicable to, to many, many industries. So. I suppose that kind of wraps it up from my side. I, I think we can just end it there. I've, I've put my contact details if anyone wants to get get hold of me with any questions and yeah, I just open it up for questions and answers.